uh, again, it's uh, Thursday, September 9th, uh, meeting of the Historical Commission. And I would like to call the meeting to order and um, welcome our guests. But uh, first, uh, kind of a roll call of commission members to declare that we do have a quorum. Um, Nancy Nelson. Here. here. And Alan Bogosian. Here. And myself, Melissa Saulfield. I'm here. Um, we are missing a few folks, so I'm sorry they can't be here because we have a big agenda tonight. And we have some guests. Um, so I will just uh, move ahead on, on item number one, which is the 99 Sudbury Road preservation restriction. And we have a special guest, Carissa, Dem I hope I have Demore, Demore? <laughs> Demore, that's right. Demore, uh, from Historic New England, who uh, will explain um, oh, the great. oh, great. Impressive document, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's a wonderful house. And I, I think we're all, speaking myself, I'm thrilled to know that it'll be uh, protected. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and um, you know, kudos to all of you if you managed to get through the uh, tremendous tome that is the legal document itself. <laughs> so uh, I'll try and give you a, a bit of a condensed uh, explanation of, of what this is all about. Um, <clears throat> I'm here, of course, on behalf of Historic New England, formerly known as SPNEA, uh, if that rings any bells for anyone. Yeah. Um, we're the oldest and largest regional preservation organization um, in the country. So um, I'm here tonight to seek support from the Historical Commission um, for the preservation restriction that protects the Scotchford Wheeler House at 99 Sudbury. Um, in 2013, Historic New England actually worked with the owners of the property at that time um, to protect it with the preservation restrictions that have been recorded at this point. Um, but at that time, there was an outstanding mortgage on the property um, that prevented us from completing the entire process of making these restrictions perpetually binding. Um, and the, the final sort of part of that process is to receive approval from the town and from uh, Massachusetts Historical Commission. Um, um, so Mass General Law allows restrictions like these to be perpetually binding, meaning that they, they continue on, on all future owners, um, but only if they're approved and only if prior interests uh, have subordinated their rights to the restrictions. So basically there can't be someone first in line in the chain of title. Um, ahead of the restrictions. Um, so, so that mortgage kind of got in our way in 2013. But at this point, um, the good news is it's been extinguished um, oh, so we can great. move forward. And the timing is kind of perfect because um, the family is now getting ready to sell this house into private ownership in, um, uh -huh. outside of the family for the first time in, in its history. Wow. Wow. Um, so being able to sort of strengthen the protections for the property is a really great thing. Um, so before I, I speak to the select board and ask them to actually vote their approval of, of the restrictions, I wanted to come and speak with, with all of you as the keepers of history in town um, and hopefully get your support um, for these preservation restrictions. Um, and if you'd like, I'm happy to share uh, a few photos of the house. I know the ones in the document are terrible, um, <laughs> terrible bad photocopies of what are really lovely photos actually. Um, and of course the entire property was documented in 2013 and those photos are archived um, in our library and archives. So they'll be available um, and kept for, for future research and things as well. Really great. A question about the uh, photos. Um, is it possible to get copies or have them in our own special collections associated with that property as part of our, you know, they would be connected to that 99 Sudbury Road, which is all a part of our historic uh, resources plan? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Absolutely. Let me let me look into that. I'm not actually sure what the what the process is um, from our library and archive standpoint, but um, certainly something we would support. This is right, right. absolutely um, locally significant. So. Uh, well, let me share just, just a couple of photos uh, that are in color that maybe will help explain uh, a little great. bit about this, if I can get the... Oh, I can't... Um, Heather, it looks like I can't share my screen. Can you now? I made you co-host. Oh, yes, that looks promising. <laughs> <laughs> The joys of technology. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah. is everybody seeing uh, some uh, a picture of the house? 
<laughs> yeah. yeah, beautiful. <laughs> oh, good. All right. Okay. So this is this is 99 Sudbury. Um, and uh, local tradition maintains that the house was constructed in 1653 by John Scotchford, who was an original settler of Concord Plantation. Um, in 1696, it was sold to Deacon Edward Wheeler. Um, and then during the American Revolution, uh, supplies for the Continental Army were actually stored at the house. Um, let's see. So just to show you the inside, uh, this is the front stair hall. Um, the house remained in the Wheeler family uh, all the way through this day. And of course, Richard and Betty Ann Wheeler um, purchased the house in 1975 and took excellent care of it. But they knew that their children were unlikely to want to keep it. Um, and so that's why they began working with us in 2013 to ensure its preservation in, in other ways. So this shows you sort of the entire complex uh, of buildings that are, are at the property. Um, it's actually uh, over a half an acre lot. It's a 0.69 acre lot, which is relatively large for Concord. Mm -hmm. um, and the restrictions protect the open space as important context for the house. So subdivision will be prohibited here and it gives historic New England review over new buildings and structures to make sure that they're sympathetic and compatible with the house. Um, and then the house itself retains a lot of its 18th century character in that main block. Um, and it has two smaller um, 19th century additions off to the sides and a 20th century addition that extends off the back and includes that, that two car garage that you're seeing there. And then one more interior shot. Um, a lot of the original architectural elements survive inside um, unaltered, including things like timber framing, paneling and other woodwork, um, door hardware, plaster walls and ceilings, softwood floors. Um, so uh, if you've made it through those, those legal documents, then you'll see that all of those elements are protected by the preservation restrictions. Um, but there's also lots of flexibility in the document so that future owners can update the house to modern needs as well, just with some, some oversight and guidance by Historic New England. So that's, that's what I'll share in terms of photos at this point. Thank you. It is, I, I mean, I don't know, Nancy, you've probably been in it. I've been in it. It's beautiful. They took excellent care of it. They loved that house and they were so proud of the Wheeler family and the history of the family here in this town. And it's a, it's, yeah. it's a wonderful thing that what you're doing, um, particularly is it's right downtown. You pass, you know, if you go and live in Concord, you pass by it daily, just about. Yeah, I, I have been in it. And um, I wonder what's going to happen to the, the uh, long gun over the fireplace in the parlor, in the North parlor. Um, I'm so happy to learn about this. I didn't know about it. Um, I thought something might be brewing among the family. And I'm so happy to learn that um, Historic New England is going to hold this restriction. Um, it's still going to be um, interesting to monitor, um, especially the interior features. And um, there has been a trend recently to approve the replacement of historic windows with, you know, nice Marvins. So I was very happy to read the, the um, provisions um, to protect the windows and other really important architectural features that seem to be overlooked these days. So um, I think this is fantastic. I'm so happy to hear about it. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, Alan, you have any comment? Have you ever worked in it? Or are you there, Alan? <laughs> worked in it, no, no. But I, I, think it's, I think it's terrific that they're taking it over to do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Chris, what do you need from us other than a sense <laughs> of our enthusiasm? Well, if you, if you wouldn't mind um, uh, voting support, perhaps, um, voting to support approval of the restrictions. Okay, um, okay. We can, uh, uh, then I can, I can share that with the select board when I go to them. I, I have one suggestion. Um, let us know when you're going and we could also show up. <laughs> that wouldn't be a bad thing. <laughs> Probably. Perfect. I will do I that. Think, I think it would be a good idea. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 
it would be a pleasure because it's yeah absolutely it's a success yeah, yeah. You talk about trying to preserve the properties in town this is a success yeah absolutely. feels really good <laughs> feels great so could i have someone make a motion um i I would make a motion that we uh, vote to support the preservation restriction on the Scotchfield, Scotchfield? Scotchford. Wheeler House, thank you, um, on 99 Sudbury Road. Second it. Uh, second it. All in favor? Nancy? Aye. Uh, Alan? Aye. Melissa? Yes. I said, and I'm pretty sure if everyone else was here, you'd get it even more, more votes. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, this is fantastic. Thank you very, very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Carissa. Thank you. Um, that was easy. Um, I'm, gonna take, <laughs> um, I'm moving on to the next item, but I'm going to switch around and move item three up to next. So Greg Higgins um, can... Um, uh, help us uh, make a re recommendation, I guess, that you're looking for, for uh, Center and Main Street names, house names? You represent- yeah, I, you know, uh, Actually, uh, I'm in real estate and, I, and Kim Camo and I have represented this science corporation and they, because we're from Concord, they asked us to give them some names and we thought it was smart to at least get folks, if we're gonna name it after people, get people that <clears throat> lived in and, and had some influence in the West Concord area. So these are the names that we came up with. And apparently they, Symes um, has suggested the where they would like them. I don't know whether you can approve all the names and then Symes picks. I've never done this before. I'm, he couldn't be here. He's at, uh, Jeff Reuter is at another meeting. Um, but those are the names and I, yes, there's, and, and this is what we gave uh, signs as, as the reason those names might be seen as important. Um, and the first cluster is what we gave him originally. And when he asked for, for me to define them, I added the two more at the bottom, but I, because they're not in the original letter, I don't suppose they're part of the suggestion here. Um, Heather, uh, what is the, the town actually are the, Police department or who? In fact, who does actually make the final decision? I don't know who makes the final decision. It might be the planning board as part of the approval. Um, I do know the original list of names. The these names right here um, have been okayed by the police department and the fire department. Okay. Um, the the two added names and they would need to review them if we wanted to add those into like the running or wanted those names. And I would suggest that they are they don't one of them uh, Renee's doesn't qualify given the fact she's was lived over in the east part of town although she was very involved in the community. <laughs> and Anna Mannion I think she was from uh, the route to the West Concord route two side of the town but. It does seem as though we'll just stay with the top one. Um, so, I well, I mean, I, I think they're all fine. I guess, I mean, speaking personally, I kind of like the idea of Bob Carter because I, you know, I I knew him uh, yeah. and I remember his store very well, and um, I didn't know the other folks, but Bill Sullivan because of the Damon Mill. I mean, I certainly yeah. knew him. Um, those are my two favorites, but they're both on Road B, so. Yeah. Alan, Nancy? I'm, I'm just a little confused. These are possible names for several properties or that one property? On that the, one property has two. Right, two needs, roads. Needs two names. It's, yeah. sort of fork, it's sort of forks. I don't have the plan in front of me, but it's sort right, of forks. Right, right, right. So I oh, guess yeah, there it is. is. There it is. Yeah, yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, yep. Oh, I wish Bob Gross was here. Oh, well, he could tell us the entire story of oh. each person. Although he he didn't remember these too well, but um, I mean, I would be inclined. I, I would be inclined um, not to name one Fowler because we've already got the library. It'd be an opportunity to um, 
you know, and include another name and hope people will come to know who that person was a little bit more like the Hayden or Hogan. That's and I, I would kind of go, I mean, I, I knew Carter and I knew Billy Sullivan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Both of them. So I, I would tend to go with those two names. Yeah, I would, go, Concord. I would go road A, Carter and row B, Sullivan, because they really, yeah. me, they really represent West Concord. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I remember Bill Sullivan very well, actually. Even though Billy was from Lexington, it's okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, he sure participated in Concord Town he meeting did. a lot. He did, he sure yeah. did. You know, sure they refer to Carter as Mr. West Concord. I used to think that, you know, that's how, so, I, I mean, so that would be my recommendation. Yeah. A is Carter and B is Sullivan. And I would agree which with that. Not, which okay. is not exactly what you've got up there. Yeah. And I, I also think A, you know, uh, actually, in, the Hayden is a big Lexington family too. And I think people might get a little confused <laughs> with yeah. that. That's well, right. we don't want to promote anything about Lexington. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Okay, so I don't think we need to vote on this. Um, so I, I mean, Greg will, can report back, but I'll also respond to Jeff Ruta's email um, with your suggestions. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. And thank you for bumping me up, Melissa and Heather. I appreciate that oh. very much. I, it's a birthday thing I have to do in a couple of minutes. So thank you so much. It, I really appreciate Is it. Is that yours? Should we wish you a happy birthday? No, well, my birthday was actually saturday and for my birthday i got a virtual magic show which is tonight at eight o'clock so i'm going to sit with my daughter and disappear we're going to do this thing i don't have it's all in a lockbox we can't open for another 40 minutes 30 minutes oh, and then we open it and go in and sit there and enjoy the evening i guess it's okay that's great well, thank that's you so great. much Thank you. Well, happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you so much. All righty. Enjoy. Good. Thanks for what you do. Uh, okay. Um, so now uh, back up to uh, number two, discussion on Route 2A improvements and also um, a discussion about, uh, I hope you all read the response from Kurt Jurgensen to the letter that we had sent to him. Um, I, I would just appreciate your suggestions about things that uh, we should, how we should respond to him. Um, I mean, I certainly have some ideas. I realized the letter was general and, and did not specify particular areas that we objected to. It was over kind of overall an objection. Part of it that there was to us inadequate public, um, a, a public presentation so that we supported the formation of a working group. Um, and I think we didn't put it in there, but I think there's a term consulting party that we would like to be a consulting party. So I already have some thoughts about how to respond to him, but I would appreciate Nancy and who has probably the most uh, involvement with this and Alan, your comments. Alan, you wanna go first? Well, I, I just think that it's a very generic letter that, that they're gonna proceed the way they're gonna proceed regardless of our input or not. <laughs> probably. And well. <laughs> I think that we, we really need to get down a brass tax and list out some bullet items. <laughs> Yeah, we can go to them and say we want we we would like to be involved in this this and this. Yeah, um, I can. I think I can add some things to that. Um, I think we. Um, um, I have reviewed these twenty five percent to seventy five percent plans until my eyes won't do it anymore. It's very hard at a half scale to sometimes discern the details of these, these, um, these extensive plans. But um, there are a few things that I think are, um, that really could be very um, impacting in an adverse way. And they would include the widening of the road surface Okay. To accommodate shoulders for bike travel. They're shrinking the size of the lanes so that they can have a little more, but they still need to expand the pavement. I'm having trouble figuring out exactly where the pavement's going to be expanded and by how much. 
um, there are 10 splitter islands located um, within the project area, most of them within the national park. Um, splitter islands are vertical granite curving structures that are filled with concrete. You can see the example further out Route 128 as it crosses over, um, I mean Route 2 a as it crosses over 128. Um, they're very sort of modern, modern things. So the raised splitter islands are these heavy, more heavy duty structures that are supposed to slow down traffic and whatnot. And that's an, um, a goal that everybody can probably agree upon. Uh, Nancy, um, Nancy, quick question. Where on Route 2 so that I, I would know what I'm looking at? Route, route 2A. Route 2A. Oh, um, if you continue Route 2A going east towards um, Lexington, yeah. there are some of these. There are actually splitter islands that are not granite vertical granite curves, they're actually sloped. So they're less intrusive, um, but still very hefty structures. So it would be something like those. And apparently Mass Highway has the same problem the National Park has in terms of maintaining roadsides and, and things like that. So there's all kinds of weeds and everything in them. Um, so the other things are the crosswalks. There are two of these heavy duty crosswalks that are located um, within the national park boundaries. Um, and in addition, three additional crosswalks um, within the national park have been requested um, by another party and perhaps Mass Highway has agreed to those. Um, these crosswalks um, would apparently include these large elevated islands, again, with vertical granite curves, uh, five, by five, five by five concrete, uh, landing pads on both sides of the road. Um, the crosswalk poles themselves with signs, flashing lights, and advance warning signs. And um, the most troubling thing to me is none of the crosswalks that are proposed either by others or by Mass Highway have connecting paths on the other side of Route 2A. So they all would require more thought about how to do that. Um, vertical granite curves are proposed in several other locations and there's going to be a significant increase in pavement markings and signs in the area. The National Park submitted a, an 11 page critique of the plans which went sheet by sheet um, and was very much more detailed. So um, these uh, changes would really impact adversely impact the simple and scenic nature of Route 2A uh, in the National Park area. Um, itself a historic road. Um, it was a battlefield actually on April 19th and along the battle road, um, uh, British soldiers were killed and buried very close to where they fell. And I think this has not really been taken into adequate consideration. So um, I think we already um, uh, supported the working group that was suggested by the National Park Service. And um, one of the things we should talk about tonight is whether we would like to request consulting party status, which is provided under national laws, the National Historic Preservation Act and the National Environmental Policy Act because the project is 75% federally funded. And um, I contacted somebody at uh, Federal Highways today to see what would be involved and how to do that because they are the people who recognize consulting parties. Um, they were um, enthusiastic about um, um, agreeing to accept and recognize uh, Concord Historical Commission as a supporting or a consulting party. That would not give us any veto power, but it would express our interest in the, the overall thing. And there are there is a proposal to realign the Lexington Road 2A intersection too. So it would just give us a voice. Um, and I think it would be a good idea. If we were when, when you talk about the, the crosswalks, does that mean that sidewalks might not be too far be, behind that? 
Um, Which means digging up more of the more of the old battlefield. Yeah, I think honestly, there's not very much room to do that without disrupting um, old stone walls. Right. Um, some of the stone walls along that stretch are new. Um, and Mass Highway actually did those as part of a mediated settlement with the National Park years ago, and they used the wrong kind of stones. Mm -hmm. But, um, but um, in one area, one of the towns has asked for a stone retaining wall between Bedford Lane and Bedford Road, which is a very long stretch actually. And that would require demolishing the stone wall and building a retaining wall and taking out some of the topography on the other side. I don't think that's feasible because it would, I think it would, it would, uh, and they have not accepted that. Mass Highway has not accepted that idea. But just to give you an idea, um, the archaeology in that area is um, very sensitive. So, well, all of this stuff would dis disturb archaeology that is yet to be determined. I know that was one of the gentlemen's, uh, Kurt Jurgensen's criticism of our letter, um, but you don't know what's there until you dig it up. And we know it was a battlefield, therefore we know something's there. And yeah. any of this would disturb that. The other thing would be they've got to create drainage for this road. That mm. really would disturb it. Yeah. The other thing that I... I looked up because I really don't, didn't know that much about what it meant to be an all-American road, but it is a very specific definition. And this is now, since in 2020, it was designated an all-American road, which according to the definition, it must possess multiple intrinsic qualities that are nationally significant and have one-of-a-kind features that do not exist elsewhere. The road must also be considered a destination unto itself. That's what the federal government says. Um, and it has been so distinguished or designated. So um, the idea of the road as is, is a destination unto itself. What they are proposing would dramatically change what we see today. Yeah. I, you know, just right out of the box. So um, I, I'm wondering if they've even considered the fact that this is an all American road. So that's just another thing that I would put in the letter. I think all of what Nancy said, that is very specific and that uh, responds directly to what Jurgensen is asking for. The, the interesting thing is that under the National Environmental Policy Act and the National Historic Preservation Act, the 106 consultation um, with historical commissions is supposed to happen early. And there has been tremendous amount of uh, consultation with these selected stakeholder groups that have not have not involved over the last year or so, maybe now approaching two years, um, have not involved historical commissions at all. So they're pretty late getting this consultation. So yeah, and I you know I did um, I reached out to Marilyn Fenelosa. She is the chair of the Lexington Historical Commission. And as far as I know, they still have not been officially notified. We know Lincoln was because they sent in a letter. We mm -hmm. have sent a letter. Um, the National Park sent a letter. The town of, town of Lexington sent a letter. Um, yeah, Lexington, Lexington Historical Commission also sent a letter that said, we didn't get a letter, so right. here's what we think anyway. But it was very, very short. Right, she said that because she knew from us, because I had talked yeah. to her. Right, right, from you. That we received a, a letter from them. Mm -hmm. uh, so she, uh, you know, so, okay, well, um, what I will propose to do is I will uh, take into what Nancy has said and add some other stuff and then, um, you know, so give it to you, Heather, and see what you think, and then we will send the letter back. Do, can I, are we allowed to send this around to the other members of the commission so that we don't have to wait till another month, or what's it's the, not for comment. We can just send it to them and say, this is our response. Okay. Well, I wish Bob Gross was here because I know he'd know a lot about this, but um, it was interesting. A woman from Lincoln, uh, uh, recited a lot of the history of the Battle Road and the efforts to protect it going back 
to 1930 or before and um that would be well i i do have another thing uh, actually um that i was going to include um and, and i asked nancy help on this i so reached out to lou sedaris who was the former chief of interpretation for minuteman national historical park right. lou right. gave an excellent talk a few years ago about the formation the history of the formation of minuteman a lot of included a fair amount about the road but about you know remember the, all the the motel and the swanson's pontiac and all the gas stations and all the whatnot that, ice cream don't forget just ice cream. <laughs> uh, along 2a that had to be removed in order to uh rehab the landscape um so i have the youtube um address which i was going to send back to this guy kurt and suggest you please watch it it was um it's long because it was a public talk that he gave but he had excellent slides um I sure wish we'd had those when we were fighting <laughs> Massport. I don't know where they all were. Lou had them. At any rate, it's an excellent description and I think um, would have a lot of weight if you pay attention to it. So I was, you know, I was going to add that. Um, uh, so other comments? I think our first letter cited the long history of efforts to protect Battle Road. It did. It so did. It did. We're on record. Um, again, I don't, you know, I. he's probably an engineer and just wants to get this project through and our uh, concern about the history of the road and what lies beneath it and what it represents is not that important. He to might him. not be an engineer. <laughs> what? He might not, he might be, not be an engineer. <laughs> well, okay. So um, that's what I'll do. Then I won't re uh, draft a response, uh, send it to you, Heather, and uh, we'll fix it up and then send it to everyone to, that this is what we're gonna send back. You have, you have a hand. Hope I have a, hello. You mute, muted. Hello, uh, thank you. Yeah, uh, just a citizen comment if I might. Oh yes, hello, yes. Mark Ailis. Hi. Hello. Yes, Mark Ailis, 62 Prescott Road. I just wanna say I, I um, uh, I'm, I'm also concerned about the, you know, depending on the extent of this uh, project, um, uh, really having a negative effect on this sort of gateway into historic Concord. Yeah. And even though it's primarily in Lincoln, it's not the gateway to Lincoln, it's the <laughs> gateway to Concord for most visitors off of 128. So um, I really support your efforts here. Um, I strongly support the idea of asking for consulting status. I strongly support the idea of coordinating with the other historical uh, uh, groups um, and the other towns. Um, since the National Park um, gave, um, you know, a more detailed analysis uh, or suggestions, apparently, I, mean, I haven't read it, read it. Um, uh, one thing that the, low, the town's historic uh, commissions could do is to say, we strongly support all the you know, concerns raised or recommendations or whatever in the uh, National Parks uh, letter, just to you know, add more, even more weight to that because they right now are the primary uh, historical custodian of that area, right? And, and um, uh, but they can use all the help they can get because anything involving the federal government involves votes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, anyway, and um, with regard to the archeology, span um, uh, I don't know what the mass laws and the federal laws and whatever, I know a lot of it has to do with Native Americans, but um, the, you know, they, they really should um, do a study or at least a paper study of what's known as you were mentioning. I mean, before they start, de you know, bringing in excavation equipment and uh, and all that. And because, you know, they, they should have, a, you know, it shouldn't just be, here's the boundary of the state-owned land and yeah, we can go a few feet over that. And it should be, well, what's under that state-owned right of way, et cetera. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't Thank have much more to say, but. No, thank you very much for listening in and your comments. That's very helpful. So um, can I just quick question, Nancy, what being a consulting party, um, does that mean they have to notify us when there's a meeting of the working group or what, what does that really allow? 
I'd have to look at my cheat sheet, but um, what it does is it gives you access to information um, about the project. Um, hang on, let me see if I can find it. I have a whole document on this. Um, I used to know it by heart. Heather might know it, but it, it um, let me see. Um, let's see, see, see. Um, in titles, consulting party status, in titles, uh, consulting parties, uh, the ability to share views, receive and review pertinent information, offer ideas and consider possible solutions together with the federal agency and other consulting parties. So the okay. park will be a consulting party. Uh, Lexington has, has, uh, Historical Commission has asked for consulting party status as well. Um, so uh, it doesn't guarantee, it doesn't guarantee that they're going to listen or accept what you say, right. but you yeah. have the opportunity and it's a recognition that you have interest substantial. Any voting rights? <laughs> I'm not sure you do. <laughs> Depends well, on how effective you're, I think, uh, I think uh, no vote. I think no vote. The, the final decision rests with the agency, the federal agency, and uh, in this case, Mass, Mass Highway also. Mark, are you got your hand up? Is that what that means? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I, there was one more comment I wanted to make is that despite not feeling having veto power or authority or whatever, I wouldn't get discouraged because the, uh, if if we don't speak up, it could be even worse. Things, <laughs> you know what I'm saying. Things. Oh yeah. It need it, 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 it. If there's no pushback, it could be even worse. Yeah, I think that's right. And and it's interesting because um, the National Park and Mass Highway have a history of cooperating on some important uh, projects. Even uh, there was a mediated agreement that was facilitated at the time by Governor Weld, but we, we ended up having, having some interesting and, and productive conversations with Mass Highway that led to a better solution at the eastern end of the park. Not perfect from the park's point of view, but per, perhaps better perhaps, than it might have been. Perhaps the park should invite the governor for a tour. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, maybe. Um, Okay, well, I think we've got um, plenty to with uh, information to respond to this. Um, the only other, the other question is, I mean, we don't reiterate the our request for a working group. The working group, I thought, though, would also likely include the national park. Yes. Oh would, yeah. Oh yeah. It was the national park suggestion. So yeah, I assume so. that I, I assume somebody might think they ought to lead it, <laughs> but but <laughs> I don't know. I don't. I have no idea about that. That would be good. Well, um, okay. Well, so thank you. I think we've got. Um, uh, is there more that uh, Heather, you, or Nancy want to add about what? Because you're on the bylaw. I mean, the byway committee. Go ahead, Heather. Uh, Heather, I Heather made some great comments actually at one meeting. <laughs> she was great. Um, I think one of the things we may mentioned in the letter is that the plans provided to everyone and the lack of like a presentation or public you know forum at all kind of limits if you if you can't read engineering plans you have no idea what what they're planning to do by looking at these plans right. um so to just the average person you can't you can't even tell what they're doing um so i i think that's that's one of the flaws and I don't know if they were trying to be sneaky and you know I do <laughs> get things by because we can't read the plans um but I think that's something we can call out in the letter as well I think that's a good point because, because I I'm, I was kind of annoyed when he was like well can you provide specific read like specific things I'm like well your plans weren't very specific. The plans we actually got in the letter was just a blue line down a map and that was it. Right, um, right. With little tiny words. Um, right. 
The it bigger does. document actually has one sheet that says there are seven crosswalks and they're all in Lexington. It's totally wrong. They, right. I mean, there's a lot of errors in this submission and it should not be at the 75%, I mean. Well, I mean, the other thing, I, which I still feel they haven't, is what's the justification or the need uh, for all these crosswalks when there are no sidewalks? Um, there are very few people who walk along there. The point of establishing and creating the Battle Road Trail was to provide access for pedestrians within the park. So. Um, it, it didn't make any sense. Right. I think that's something we can include too. Bob brought that up at the last meeting is that there's, they provided no rationale for some of these changes right. because they haven't had a public forum. So I think we can bring that up as well. Okay. Okay. So I will work. Have fun. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, thank you very much. That's a, that's a lot. Um, so we can move on to the 70 Elm Street. Um, I didn't know whether the family was going to be here. There's no reason for them to be here, right? No, I let them know that it was continued um, until today um, because we needed more time to do more research to decide on a date. Um, and then off Alan, you were able to yeah, narrow it down a little bit more. Not not so much. I mean, it's it's just that 1809 was is the first the first date. Um, 1809. I thought it was 1880. Well, it just says some sometimes. Um, what what did you have for a date? Or, I thought it was circa 1880. Well, eight, I'm sorry, eight, 1880. You know, I was interested right. that the the realtor has it as 1856. <laughs> maybe thinking I'd get a little bit more money if it was a little bit older. Um, I mean, all the documents we have, right, are probably what we have at Special Collections, which are essentially what we've got copied here. Right. And I, I think if, you know, if we can't narrow it down and we're not comfortable with the 1856 date that the applicants suggested, then we, you know, approve it with the circa 1880 date. I mean, I... I don't know my architectural history that well, but it strikes me that the house does not look like 1850s. No. Um, it is a later you know, you know, Italianate style. So um, is, it, is it okay for us to recommend that it's the William Hurd house circa 1880? Mm -hmm. That's yeah. okay, Heather, to do to... Yeah, yeah, that's, that's why we... you guys have review on these. Do we know any historical architects or are we comfortable with the uh, circa 1880? Is that, that's documented, somebody said, right? That's on, on yeah. all the macros forms. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay, so do we need to take a vote or? Yeah, so we would need a vote um, and the applicant put William F. Hurd, um, yeah. 1856, so we can say William F. Heard with circa 1880. What about his wife? <laughs> this is a big discussion in the Park Service, by the way. I know. <laughs> Does the wife, did the wife own it too? Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. Um, okay, Alan, would you I'm like sorry. to make a motion? I, I make a motion that we move ahead with the plaque that would say the William F. Hurd House circa 1880. Okay, all in favor, Nancy? Aye. I second and vote aye. Thank you, Thank you. <laughs> Robert Jules. Okay, and I, Alan? And I. Melissa, aye. So that's what we would recommend. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, um, and then a demolition review uh, bylaw. I I would um, I have just to report to you that what I I uh, you know part of this mass mass historical lister which some of you may be on as well. And I sent out a question um, of the four areas that we were talking about um, about partial demolition, whether the, the delay runs with the property or the owner whether there's an application fee and whether they require a certified engineering report. And I've gotten response from 10 communities, uh, which I thought was very helpful. Um, and um, 
you know, right now I have it on an Excel spreadsheet, which I could just send out to everybody, can I, Heather? You can email it to me and I can send it to everyone. Okay. Um, just to see, I mean, I just was trying, you know, I wish, well, I don't know, 10 communities is a pretty good representation, representation and they're, they vary from, um, you know, small towns to Salem responded. Um, so, you know, it's a beginning to, for us to determine how we want to address those four areas as part of um, our plans for the next town meeting. Um, I, I don't know if there's other discussion about that. I, if anyone has any other ideas about how to glean this information, I mean, I can directly send questions to some other towns that you think might um, help our case better. I don't know. I did create a document, I don't know if everyone saw it um, online, that included some of the other towns' definitions. Um, like I took them right from their bylaws so we can see examples of how partial demolition is defined in other towns and it varies widely. Yes. Um, how other towns define partial definition and how they administer their bylaws in regards to partial de demolition. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. And then the only town that I could find um, about the delay running with the owner and starting over if the property sells is in Newton's bylaw. So that example um, was on the document as well that I put online. Newton, okay. right? Did you yeah, say Newton? Newton. Yeah, yeah very, yeah. very clear and specific, yeah. which yeah. I liked. Um, that's, that's quite, that's- I think we'll just copy well and paste that right problem. into ours. Yeah. yeah, that's- Actually, there are some yeah. others. Uh, Brookline and Lexington knew too. With right, I could not find it in their bylaw. Like I kept reading and reading and I'm like, I don't know. It's it not is. like specifically called out anywhere that I could find it. Well, maybe mine, because, you know, again, I got answers. I didn't necessarily, they didn't necessarily send the document itself. Right, yeah, because you sent me the spreadsheet. So then I went and looked at all those towns bylaws and started pulling from them. Um, and I could not find it like specifically called out. I don't know. I mean, technically it's not specifically called out in ours either. Um, so maybe people just say it runs, you know, they just have always assumed it runs with the owner and not the property. Um, but I think it's best to specifically define that in the bylaw, especially if we're changing it. I, I do too. I, I mean, I, and I clearly think that it's a much, it makes it a much stronger document. I actually was kind of pleased. Um, I was concerned that our doc, our bylaw was, was weak. Um, but in fact, I think there are some communities much, they're much less power, potent than ours is. Yeah. Um, so I, but I, but well, I think we're on the track. We will, with this, if we can get these four things through, this would strengthen it considerably, particularly that it, having a run with the owner. I mean, that could be the single most powerful thing. Yeah, yeah I agree right. with that. That could right. be huge. You know, the idea about a certified engineering report, a number of them said, um, you know, we rely on the, our building inspector to provide the information. Oh, but that's not before the fact. Is it? Well, they're saying that, you know, we, we're saying when if someone comes and says, well, it's structurally unsound and we say, well, we would like to get a certified engineer's report. Uh, and I think in the case of maybe it's Lexington, it has to be a certified engineer with demonstrated experience with historic properties. Oh, um, which would even be stronger. Well, isn't it a burden on the town if it's a building inspector that has to do it? I would rather that they yeah. have that that responsibility. That I, I would agree. Also, oh, and okay. that they have to pay for it. Um, yeah. And that's really a good uh, clarification that it should be somebody with preservation background. I mean, that's, um, that's something that's um, an issue right now with Wright Tavern. The engineer doesn't, he's a very good engineer, 
but doesn't doesn't know historic structures. So I'm sorry, Heather. Did is this? I missed all of this document. I'm sorry about that. Is this oh. on our current meeting documents? Yes, this is under current meeting documents. I just put together. It's just called other towns definitions. Yeah. Um, so I pulled like Brookline. This is how they define partial demolition. Duxbury. It's not in their bylaw. It's just a rule of thumb, which is interesting. Um, Lexington. This is how they defined it. Um, Newton is very detailed on how they define partial demolition. Yeah. Um, Salem, Somerville, and those were the ones that I pulled. Yeah. Um, and they all... very widely. So I don't know if people reviewed them and kind of lean towards one or the other or. Well, these, because so these are all the ones that responded to me. So these, you, you know, I mean, it's, it's certainly a good cross section of the, of, the state, I mean, it's mostly in the East, but that's okay. Um, I, I would like to have everyone review this and think uh, for a further discussion next month. Okay. Yeah. Um, this is a great document, Heather. Yeah. And I can try to add to it too um, yeah. over the next month before our next meeting to see um, yeah. what other towns there are and I can add yeah. to it. I didn't really. Yeah, because I, I think really it's great to see it side by side and how different they are. Like Lexington's is just the short paragraph, whereas Newton's yeah. is like two pages long. <laughs> yeah, uh, that might scare town meeting. Yeah, I, I think I think we go with something smaller. Like, and if in the future we want to drill down and define it more, then amend it further to mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. follow Newton's. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that would be a little scary. Yeah, to yeah to pass. I do too. And they're I, so much bigger, you know, and they've got, they've been at this a long time. Well, yeah, in the last few years, they've done a lot, right? right because yeah. they were having such a problem with so many tear downs. Well, one of the things I think is interesting is that um, so, um, there's a previous concrete planner there now. Oh, that's right. Right. Chrysler. Yeah. That's right. Um, I think she's she's gone now. Is she really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Recently. Maybe. Yeah, hmm. she's gone. Oh wow. I didn't know. At, at any rate, um, the thing that was interesting to me is that most of these communities do have partial. Um, they reference partial. partial whereas ours yeah. is it has to be the entire building. So. I think this this would really strengthen our case if we if you know when we go to present because the, Barrett, the son of uh, Colonel James Barrett House um, is being advertised as original. <laughs> no, not original, but um, as the house of the son of Barrett. I can't remember exactly, but well, you know, it's only the front facade, come on. And we'll definitely be using those photos in our presentation to town meeting. Yeah. And, and yeah. does partial mean take everything down but one wall? Exactly. Well, yeah. We know where that went. Right, yeah. uh, right. Or exactly. a couple, couple of experiences with that, right? Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. that's that's the definition of partial. Of what? Partial. Oh yes, right. That's but, where but they like clearly to... define it. Yeah, yeah. They yeah. didn't have to come before us because it wasn't total, right? So right. in this case, if we were to get this thing through, they would have to all the, a number of these would have to come before us. So correct. Yeah, that would be great. This is excellent. Thank you. Yeah, it's very good. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, so uh, and historic. And moving on to the next thing, historic issues. Coffee. So. Um, I had asked uh, Rebecca, I sent her, a, I started on a list of names to contact and she filled in a lot and added them. Um, is this something, I think I better do it myself. I don't wanna share email addresses. I don't think that's appropriate. But the idea, what I'm trying to do is uh, get more names, initial names of people that we can reach out to so that we can have uh, um, an initial historic coffee maybe in October. Um, to talk, I think uh, uh, an obvious um, uh, uh, topic would be the Route 2A project, because um, I hope a number of people that would attend or participate are familiar with this. 
uh, including those of us here in the commission, but others that we might invite. So if you guys were thinking, I mean, so I, I came up with the usual suspects. I mean, obviously the historic districts, the historical commission, the people of the um, historic properties, national park, but I mean, it, it just it's, it's average citizens who just care about historic issues of Concord um, participating like Mr. Galas, that's a, you know, he, he, he's a good one to add. Anyway. Right, that's a good idea. Um, so if you guys have neighbors or, you know, please send me their names and I will try to, you know, get emails. Um, and then I don't know if this should be a morning thing, at like eight, seven thirty, eight o'clock. Nancy, you participate in the conservation copies for years. Um, I think I think that is seven thirty on Tuesdays, um, but not in the summer because they're so so busy with um, permitting and whatnot. But we wouldn't have that same problem. But we would have an attendance problem, probably at seven thirty. No, um, during the summer. Well, so oh, people come in this, um, um, but you know, we have to think about Heather. <laughs> well, Heather, yeah, so or whoever's going to unlock the building. Well, we probably won't be able. To, I, I, that's a question whether or not this needs to be a, um, a Zoom meeting. Um, that's easier, probably, for now, right? I think it would be easier. I'm I'm just concerned that there may be we you know restrictions reimposed. Uh, if no, I know. The, um, Heather, what what are you hearing from the town? No updates right now. Um, I think most boards are still operating mainly on Zoom. Um, some are doing hybrid, um, but I think for the most part, everyone's still on Zoom. Um, and in terms of getting into the building, um, we believe we have a key that I may be able to like let the chair pick up the night before. Um, daycare drop off is at 730, so I can't be there till eight. Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, I mean, the other the other towns are, are all, all the town halls are open but uh, everyone has masks. So the, the town halls are open. You can actually go in and visit, but you need to wear a mask. So they're not right. keeping you out. So I think Concord's really the only one we still can't go in. You, you can, know. our offices are open. To, um, vi to visit? To, yes, to yeah, we're around. open to okay. the public. Um, the, my building is open nine to three, Monday through Thursday. Um, and I, I don't know, like with the mask mandates changing, like in Lexington, I know mm -hmm. um, everywhere indoors, you have to wear a mask in Lexington again, in Newton. In Brookline. I was in um, Brookline today, same thing, Boston. Right. So it may thing. be coming to Concord soon, mm -hmm. which means if right. we scheduled something, um, everyone would need to wear a mask. So it kind of makes more sense to just do it on Zoom. Right. Yeah. Um, well, I, I would, I think Zoom is fine. You know, I, it's not a preferred way to go, but it's what has kept everything going. Um, so I think it would be safer and better. And, and you can't, you know, the issue of being in person is you generate, I think you generate more enthusiasm or energy, but when you're behind a mask, I'm not so sure you may lose it all over again. So, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, well, I, I hate to, I'm hoping that we can run these things without troubling you, Heather. The idea, these are, these are community, co community coffees. They're not official, but um, so they shouldn't have to require you to be there. If you could just help me figure out how do I host Zoom or someone could maybe host the Zoom thing. Yeah, so I could, we could set up a Zoom meeting and I could start it um, and, um, let you kind of run it. Okay. Co-host co -host or something. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, that's a good way to start anyway. Yeah. I just think it seems to be as much more um, responsible too. I, it, since we don't, this virus isn't going anywhere. And although Concord has a pretty high rate of vaccination, it's still- Yeah, but um, I just saw something from the public health people that said there were, from 
uh, between July 1st and more or less now, there were 88 new cases of COVID and like 22 were among kids under 12 of the remaining, whatever the math turns out to be, 66 or something, 44 of those cases were among fully vaccinated people. So we, we can't be totally flippant about this yet. And no, no, um, I, I think if, if it's not like necessary to meet in person and everything can be done on Zoom, then we should just do it on Zoom just right. so we're safe and we're not you know, potentially spreading anything. Yeah, I agree. So, um, so maybe uh, it, I could talk with you, Heather, about a, a the, kind of the week, the week, month calendar of uh, boards and commission to see if there's a morning that's not as heavily trafficked as others, okay. and then just start, just try. You know, you're not going to know, but I think I do think the Route Two A thing is an important thing to get. A, I want more of the public to understand what could be at stake here, mm -hmm. um, and. You know, Nancy, you are very familiar with this because you sit in on the meetings and that represent the the town really on the bylaw. And Heather too. Heather too. And and Beth. Beth. Williams. Beth Williams. Okay. Um, I wonder if she's on. Is she on my list? <laughs> anyway, oh, so that's I'm, a good point. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I'll keep adding to my um, email list. Um, so, okay, we have a plan for that. Um, are there any updates, reports from observer assignments? Um, HDC, Allen, I'm not sure when they, what they mean. Oh, they, the, the, the agenda really didn't look that all that interesting. There's a couple of things that were on it last week and, and Lowell Road wasn't on that. Lowell uh, Road's on next Thursday. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, Alan, do you care if I show up at that? Um, the the neighborhood was very much so. Very much so. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> We'd love to have you. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> the neighbors had contacted the land trust to yeah. see if the land trust had any ideas for them. They tried to raise some money, <clears throat> and they they fell pretty short. But. Um, but um, I know that they're talking to each other a lot. <laughs> and there's a brand new stone wall at the corner of Hildreth Street or Road, whatever it is on low corner of Lowell Road, yep. that looks a lot like a lot of the stone walls that might have been originally part of Hildreth's corner. Mm -hmm. so, so it's interesting. Yep. It's, yep. it's interesting. We'll tag team them. All right. <laughs> I'll talk to you before. Um, I was at the DPW public works meeting. Oh my gosh, I had to leave after an hour and a half. It was a really long meeting and they got really, really, really into a lot of reporting about the state, uh, state of water conservation. Um, the thing that probably um, we'll be more, most interested in um, are, is the roads program review because there's um, there's a big move and we'll have to watch what happens on Hubbard Street because Hubbard Street is having a lot of changes that are um, partly funded by the Complete Streets program maybe with state money and a lot of money from the utilities budget. So a lot of stuff is gonna happen on Hubbard Street to try to slow down the cut down, down cut through traffic, I think is the idea. So that's going to be very interesting. There were 20, 20 some people at this meeting and extensive reports on stormwater management. I actually had to leave before the director's reports, report and public comment, which was too bad. But um, there's a lot going on there, actually, that um, is very much down in the weeds and not um, probably of interest to us as citizens more than as preservationists. But, but roads are, you know, roads are a big deal. Yep. Yep. And a lot can happen on roads. So I'll um, keep going. Yep. Keep going. I can't remember. I know the planning board is still 
uh, working on the Thoreau district um, and some of the other developments. Oh, right, right, right. Um, and the Junction Village is still. Yeah, the Junction Village thing. There's several West Concord meetings that I don't, I haven't been able to attend, and so I'm not too sure yeah. um, all that's going on there. But it's there's a lot of activity. Yeah, well, Concord is very fond of committee meetings, and always has been. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. always has been. That's part of historic. We want to preserve that. We are concerned. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> um, Okay, so did I, now I can't remember it. I mentioned that um, in this Envision Concord that the town um, manager and the town select board are asking for a meeting on November 15th um, that will discuss the long range plan and um, asking each of the groups that were had some input into that um, and from it have some recommendations for uh, our work plan to kind of put together one page synopsis of what kind of what we have done, how we've responded to the uh, uh, goals that were identified as part of the Envision Concord. Um, and then to participate, that was, that's due November 10th, and then we participate in a public meeting and uh, an evening meeting on November 15th. So I would just encourage you all to please reread the section on Envision Concord uh, about historic preservation, historic Concord, do you have the page numbers by any chance? I have the executive summary, but not the whole thing printed. It, uh, I'll, I'll find it and put it online under current meeting documents because this will definitely be on our agenda in October. Okay, um, that's great. So I'll, I'll put it all online. If I remember correctly, the report itself is lengthy. It's a very long, but our section isn't too bad. Section 4.1, Cultural and Historic Resources. But it's a very, you know, it's very helpful. It's a very good document. It's a, you know, as again, it's a, kind of like a roadmap of uh, things that we should be working on. And we are, in fact, you know, the demolition delay, strengthening that's certainly in there. The historic coffees is in there. The historic resources master plan is in there. So a lot of what we are have been working on is there. Um, um, but there's additional that, um, I think we, that we need just to you know, begin to kind of formulate a plan and, have, and for our own work and uh, goals. Anyway, so that's for the next set would be for our October meeting to discuss. Um, minutes? Minutes? I drafted the minutes and put them on the website this afternoon. So I don't know if everyone oh, oh, I I had a chance to look at I them or if we'll leave them for October. <laughs> Yeah, I missed that. So I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't see that either. So I, I apologize. Well, okay. Uh, is there any other business comments from anyone? Not here. No, busy, busy. So, Alan, our right, next time are we going to see you in person? I mean, yes. I don't know what the problem is. I'm going to I'm going to work on it. I'll I'll have to talk to my IT people. <laughs> I have a young son. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, thank you all. And I think if there's no more business, then we will. Uh, thank call. you. Uh, do I have to? Oh, I need to make a motion. Someone make a motion to end the meeting. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Alan, aye. Melissa, aye. aye. Thank you. So our next meeting is uh, October. I believe oh. it's October 14th. That's a nice ring to it. Oh, October. Wow. Mm. Wow. Okay. So we will see you then, but be, there's a lot to do between now and then. Yes. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, 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 Thanks,